Mm-hmm. Hello, everyone. For those of you uh, who joined ITS seminar for the first time, I would like to say welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, my name is Siwei Hu, you can call me Martin, and I'm a third year PhD student from the University of California at Irvine. Today, we are so fortunate, uh, so honored to have Professor uh, Charles Edwards to speak with us about the cargo. I met a Professor uh, Charles Edwards at TRB as a student in TRB. Uh, I just listened to the uh, uh, big guys, big name people speak, <laughs> and right after that, I uh, have a fortunate enough to have a conversation with Professor Edwards and learn more about the aviation and the cargo. And then we um, uh, spoke with uh, Professor Edwards to explore the probability to have a seminar with us. And today we are fortunate enough, uh, Professor Edwards is going to speak with us. Uh, Professor Edwards uh, is a uh, professor of residence a uh, professor of practice in the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And he is also a vice president and the Strategy Aviation Solution International. Uh, today, uh, let's give a warm welcome to Professor uh, Edwards and give it to him. Yeah. Thank welcome, you. thank you. Thank you, Martin. And good morning or good afternoon. I think most people are on the West Coast. So good morning to you all. And I do appreciate this opportunity to talk about air cargo, which is a passion of mine. And it's been a significant part of my uh, transportation and logistics career. Um, You've seen the abstract. I'm not going to dwell on that. You can read it faster than I can speak it. Um, But primarily, I want to talk about as identified here in the table of contents. A lot of people do not understand what air cargo is all about. Um, Need to understand the disruptions, not just what's happening right now in the pandemic, but the the trail of and train of disruptions that have been occurring since time immemorial. Um, And then start to focus in on what are the key issues? And finally, what is next? Who are the players? Who can influence? And what do they need to do? So just really briefly, what is air cargo? Air cargo is the carriage of freight and mail. Um, If it's just air freight, then of course, it's not the carriage of mail. Mail, even though we rely a lot on um, um, emails and those types of electronic transmission of information, is important, although its composition has changed. And we'll talk a little bit about that with e-commerce. So mail now is more small packages than it is um, first class postage. Um, Historically, air cargo has been at the center of aviation activities and enterprises, starting with the Franco-Prussian War, roughly the 1870s. The war actually was longer than that. The Germans with their Zeppelins um, started off moving mail and then migrated to moving people. And you can see all the way down into the late thirties prior to the World War II, probably the the single largest international network was created by the United Kingdom. And it was to move mail throughout the Commonwealth. There were also links, of course, to Canada, um, but the primary focus was into Africa and all the way into Australia. Air cargo growth, you can see by this chart, um, and then I did a, um, uh, put in a power rated curve, um, has been growing exponentially and it continues to grow. And this particular graph, I'll show you one in in a minute, um, topped out in 1951. So basically from hardly anything, and this is revenue ton kilometers, how we usually express um, the amount of freight, not the value of freight, um, went from basically 53 revenue ton kilometers up to 1.1 million. And it, of course it has ex- uh, continued to grow. A more recent look, um, it does show the downturn, um, in 2020 as, a, as related to the pandemic, although we have recovered in the industry from that downturn. 
but we're now talking about 180 million revenue ton miles. So continued growth, but what's behind that? Behind it is trade. I mean, air carriers aren't just flying planes around just because they like to fly planes. They can't afford to do that, of course. Um, as the old saying goes, an airline doesn't create a market, it serves a market. And that's the same in the other three primary freight modes of marine, road, and rail, um, to a lesser extent, I guess, uh, pipeline. Um, so this just shows a trade deficit number. There's a lot of other um, trade or volumetric numbers that can justify or inform people of what's going on. But how do we as Americans get those products um, to us? A, a lot of this trade deficit, of course, is or reflects the importation of goods from all over the world. We tend to be more consumers than we are um, exporters here in the United States as opposed to other, other countries. And a lot of that um, traffic is carried by air um, from a, on a relative basis, about 70% or more of the volume is carried by marine if it's in international trade um, and 30% by air. Those, and this is very general, that those relationships are reversed when one looks at marine versus air. So even though air is a relatively small component of international trade volumetrically, it accounts for the majority of the value of goods which are moved internationally. And part of the re reason for that is if one, and I use this in my class at Chapel Hill, if you think that um, the cost of a Marine to move something by Marine is one cubic meter or one kilogram um, is costs about a dollar. Air costs 10 times that amount. So a justification for using air, except for under certain circumstances, which we can get into later. Um, traditionally, you're not going to put products on an airplane unless the cost justification of paying that higher transportation and related logistics costs are commensurately higher. In fact, approximately 10 times higher. And this is, these are, there's been a variety of studies which have justified this. In fact, even in the, um, the Chinese supported um, silk routes, the one belt system, which is both marine and rail and to a lesser extent road, those same types of relationships are bearing fruit. One needs to understand that supply chains are really three flows. Traditionally, we look at the top part of this diagram, which is the product flow. So it goes from the seller all the way to the final consignee. There used to be terms, and in fact, they're still used, but they've gone out of favor of talking about shippers and consignees. Those are functions. Those do not reflect the parties that are actually involved. And so the term that is now used and has been used since the late 80s and definitely the early 90s is the beneficial cargo owner. Think of that as yourself. When you order something online and you pay whether it's Amazon or Shopify or Alibaba or whomever, you become the owner of that cargo. You specify not necessarily how it's going to move, but you specify where it's going to be delivered, how it's going to be delivered. And of course, you're specifying what the product is. It's all part of that purchase agreement. That's happening not just in B2C, business to consumer, but also in business to business transactions. So how do we know what is moving and how do we know where it is and how do we know that the right process is being conducted in order to facilitate that move and that's information and information goes up and down the supply chain, which are really supply webs they're not 
a sequential series of activities like they used to be. There's alternative pathways and routes. And undergirding all of this, of course, is financial. Everybody wants to get paid. Uh, the creator, the producer of the good wants to be paid. All of the players in the movement of the goods from the point of origin to the point of destination want to be played and all operating within a complex ecosystem. And here's something else that's really important. So not only is the financial flow the essential glue that binds all of this together. But unfortunately, um, an air cargo, unfortunately, tends to be a laggard. It's composed of traditional silos. So the transfer of information from one party to another party is not as smooth and as open as it should be. And I'm going to talk a lot more about that. And that's where the disruption is coming into play in the industry. Think about Amazon. They did not start off as a logistics company. They are now a transportation logistics company, their own trucks or lease trucks or contracted trucks, um, their own airplanes, some of which they own, some of which they uh, contract in. Um, they have their own shipping containers. They have been chartering their own ships. They're now getting into the rail industry. They're not going to run their own trains, but they're putting containers on rail. They didn't start off that way. They started off when Bezos started Amazon. It, all they did was they sold books out of um, uh, a place out in Seattle. But they understood that, under, that having the information about their purchasers was key. Having an understanding of where they wanted, when they wanted it, where they wanted it was the key. And that's on, on that basis, that information basis is, um, is how they grew and how all of their competitors also have emerged and grown. Again, looking at capacity, we're gonna focus a little bit on, on airplanes. Back in the 1930s, the DC-3, which is down in the left-hand corner, relatively small capacity, less than uh, 50,000 pounds, a lot less than 50,000 pounds. In fact, closer to about 8,000 pounds. Um, in the 1980s with the Boeing 747-8F, the most recent variant of the Boeing 747 uh, models, um, closing in to 300,000 pounds for each airplane. When you compare all of this against what can be loaded on even a, pre, a Panamax uh, container vessel, we're talking about very, very small volumes. But there's the trade-off and speed, of course, between an international move by ocean versus an international move by air. What this diagram also shows, and while DC-3s are all but out of the system, there's, I think, three 727 freighters still operating around the world, maybe a few more, but not many. Um, the 747 and, and now the 777, um, the airplanes are now tailored for certain what we call payload range uh, segments. So a 747 and now even a 777 are for the long hauls. There are other airplanes like the Boeing 767, um, which are more suited for shorter hauls. And now we're seeing smaller airplanes um, coming into the mix. But again, they're tailored for specific route characteristics, whether it's distance, whether it's capacity, what have you, so that the operators can better manage their fleets and reflect the demand for the traffic that they're going to be carried, as opposed to trying to do a one size fits all, which doesn't work. Again, if you study the marine side of the industry, you'll see the same thing. A thousand TEU feeder may be working alongside a 24,000 um, TEU um, carrier, ultra um, large container ship. So disruptions. So in the 70s and 80s, we had a variety of companies that got into the space. A lot of people know about FedEx. 
but there was TNT, which actually started in Australia, but migrated through acquisitions to Europe. Emory Worldwide was a major freight forwarder that got into the airline business. And of course, United Parcel Service, which I was involved in bringing into the uh, into operation in 1980-81. Um, you can see through the bullet points what they brought to the table that traditionally the legacy airlines, the Americans, the Uniteds, the Air Canadas, the British Airways, et cetera, did not provide. And a key was end-to-end and end-to-end transparency, relative transparency, um, but also a simplistic way of, of dealing with them, whether it was a phone call or even the simplified forms. When I started work in the, the early 1970s for an international shipment, we had a 13-part airway bill that you um, got on a typewriter and filled out or if you didn't have a typewriter, you wrote out. Um, if you made one error, you threw that away and you started all over again. The, the first international way bills that FedEx brought out were basically a half page, maybe four or five copies, but very simple. But it had enough information that you knew what the heck you were supposed to do in handling that piece of freight. Now, there was other documents attached to it, but that simplified approach meant that more people were able to ship their own goods without having to go through the traditional arrangement, which involved a freight forwarder who, of course, charged for that service. In the 1990s, the major freight forwarders primarily, and I'll give you a panel PINA, which unfortunately, um, was devoured by another freight forwarder about a year and a half ago, um, started their own controlled lift and they used a Luxembourg airline, a cargo airline that I also used to work with, Cargo Lux, to provide service. So it operated on very discrete routes, operating into specialized airports. So here in the United States, Huntsville, Alabama was their primary port of call and it was for their own traffic or their own controlled traffic. This also threatened, here's another threat, um, to small and mid-sized freight forwarders that could not afford to control their own airlift. And so yet another disruption to what had traditionally evolved primarily since the end of World War II up until the 1970s, mid to late 70s and 80s. So a lot of change and some of the sectors of the airline industry or the worldwide air cargo logistics industry have still not responded to these disruptions, even though they've been, we've been experiencing for decades and decades. Um, the China Belt Road project, which really has emerged um, in the last 20 years, um, the 50,000 trains to date, that was as of last month. And so it's, it's even above that. What's fascinating in when one examines this uh, product and this service, which is primarily in competition with the ocean um, routes, basically from uh, China to Northern Europe, <clears throat> is A, it's faster, but it's all digital. Even going through uh, countries like Belarus, um, it's a totally digitally based system. So the transparency and also the efficiency and the speed at which cargo shipments move along this system is in some cases significantly better than ocean, but also better than air. Now, there's geopolitical issues. We were just chatting just before the lecture. Um, who knows what's gonna happen in the Ukraine um, and Belarus. And so the companies that are using these services are probably scrambling at the moment because those are two primary gateway routes um, into Western Europe of how do they move their product and how do they avoid what may or may not happen in, uh, between Russia and the Ukraine. 
e-commerce platforms. We know a lot about Amazon. Alibaba is actually bigger. And then uh, I was made aware um, Shenying, I think is the name of the company. It's also Chinese based. It's even bigger than Alibaba. Um, everybody's getting into the act. There's uh, platforms based in South America. There's platforms based in the Middle East, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this is where and it's been accelerated, it's use, these uses have been accelerated because of the pandemic uh, for a variety of reasons, but this is a major disruptor. We now have given the power of control and the rooting of products definitely to the beneficial cargo owner. Whereas in the past, the freight forwarder would work with the airline sort of the freight forwarder would select routes, would select gateways, would negotiate routes and commit to X amount of capacity. It's now individuals or either individuals or individual companies that are saying, okay, this is how you're going to not only provide the product or the service that I want, but this is how you're going to route the product. And so they are beginning to look at does this airport work or does it not? Are my trucks that I have sent there either to tender the freight for carriage or to recover the freight after the flight, can they move in and out e efficiently and effectively get the right freight at the right time so that my entire supply chain flows? We, we see the pictures and we hear about what's happening on the Oceanside, especially at the port of LA Long Beach, I see the new numbers for ships being delayed at both those ports. Long Beach is now up to 40 days just for the vessels. Um, I know that uh, the 11th or 12th largest importing company is basically saying we're never going to use the LA Long Beach um, port um, arena anymore because they're seeing on average after the their containers are discharged 45 days to get out of the port. So they've already had a 30 plus delay. So that's 75 days. It took some time to sail across the water. They can't afford to. Their cash flow is saying, that's it. We're never going to use these those two ports again. And so they're now looking at smaller ports, um, having a lot of problems on the West Coast, but they're finding smaller ports on the East Coast, and they're going to, in some cases, even if it's ridiculous from an overall perspective, they will move their freight to an East Coast port, and then they will move it all the way back to the West Coast. Um, the same issue is happening in airports. We had horrific delays at Chicago, at, at Los Angeles, at um, Kennedy Airport in New York, we're now experiencing significant day delays at Atlanta, not necessarily because of congestion, but Omicron not having enough staff, in some cases not knowing where the shipments are because we do not have the digital systems, which we should have, which many airports and ports outside the United States rely on, and we're horribly behind. So digitalization the employment of AI to basically deal with routine issues, to collect information that can be used for long, for short and long-term planning. The United States is behind this. Um, definitely behind what's happening in India, also behind what's happening in, in, in Europe and also in, in Asia. Um, what that also means is there's a, additional pressure on the traditional airlines to provide the types of services and the scale of services and products that these e-commerce platforms and um, as well as the BCOs are expecting and now demanding. There was a major company, they happened to have their logistics center here in North Carolina um, and they refused to use AIR. Um, even though, and it's a fashion house, um, they have 12 seasons of women's clothing. And so one would think they have to use air because they're constantly turning their inventory over. They refuse to use 
there because they didn't have the transparency. They didn't have the ability to see where every single one of their shipments, and they went down to this SKU level, the stock keeping unit level, was. And so they relied on Ocean because Ocean had already, this is collectively Ocean, some uh, steamship companies are better than others, had already, already recognized that this was a requirement that their customers were expecting and now demanding. And so they better figure out how to provide that, um, that response. Unfortunately, that's not happened as, as much here in the air cargo industry yet, although there is progress being made, but it's, it's very slow, unfortunately. Another disruption, and this is brand new, um, are the ocean carriers. We've all heard about the um, significant profits that Maersk, CMA, CGM, and MSC, the three largest shipping lines in the world, but they're joined by Hapag Lloyd, Zim, et cetera, are making. Well, they've recognized because they're looking at the ecosystem. They're not looking at it from a modal perspective. And they're recognizing that their beneficial cargo owner um, customers are demanding a choice. So there may be an instance where a shipment traditionally would have been moved by ocean because of a variety of reasons, it now needs to be moved by air in spite of that tenfold cost, sometimes prohibitive relationship between the two modes. What do they do? Well, the MERS, the CMA, CGM, and the MSC um, leadership are saying, we're going to invest in air. Maersk always had, well, not always, they have had their own airline star um, for many, many years, primarily operating on behalf of UPS in Europe. Um, they're expanding. We don't know if they will continue to provide that um, service for UPS, um, but they're really getting into the business. They're buying significant air freight forwarders. They've just bought a major freight forwarder. Um, they're based in Pennsylvania pilot freight. Uh, last week, they're looking for additional footprint in the freight forwarding in the terminal operations environment here in, in North America, as well as what they've already been doing and are continuing to expand in Africa, South America, Asia. They recognize that they have to, what they want to be, and there used to be a bank here in, um, in North Carolina that said, we want to be your one-stop banker. Well, they want to be your one-stop logistics and transportation provider. Doesn't matter on the mode. They're already in trucking. This is again Maersk. They're already in rail. So they're adding air to um, their modal opportunities and alternatives. Um, CMA, CGM. They're building, starting to build their own fleet. MSC is a bidder on the remnants of Alitalia now called ITA Airlines. Um, so they're all realizing we've got to provide all of the different services, the transportation, the logistics services, but they're packaged in a way that the BCO clients of all of these um, carriers have a choice and can easily migrate their shipments from one mode to the other to accomplish what they need because they, the BCOs, are being driven by what their customers want. Way back when, when I was working with uh, UPS back in the 80s, starting up their operation, the UPS mantra was, what does your customer's customer want? And then we'll figure out whether it's a pricing model, it's a operational service model, whatever it is, we will respond to those needs. And unfortunately, traditionally in the air cargo system, we focused in on, well, we'll get a plane from A to B and we'll get a shiny new airplane, um, but we won't go much beyond that. In addition to those three carriers, NYK, based in Japan, already owns an all-cargo airline, NCA, and Evergreen, uh, based in Taiwan, of course, owns EVA, which is a, a combination carrier with a very strong presence in the air cargo industry. 
supply chains have also changed. When I started back many years ago, it was a sequential process from shipper through handling all the way to the consignee. Now it's a web. It's a circular web. It's a highly dynamic web. It's a flexible web. And you have to understand if you're going to play in this particular, on this particular playground, where do you sit? Who are your real partners? And how do you work together? Um, and only then can you come up with the service that the beneficial cargo owners are expecting and increasingly demanding. So it's the current multi-pathways that are creating issues. We've heard a lot about um, omni-channel versus multi-channel uh, approaches. Um, UPS is, is primarily a omni-channel, everything, whether it's run by road, by rail, uh, by air, uh, all move through a, their same building. That, that's what they call sort centers. FedEx uh, approaches this through multi-channels. So FedEx Ground has a, a facility that's separate from FedEx Express, which is their air, air product, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's not one size fits all, but companies understand that they have to provide that flexibility in their organization and in their operation in order to respond to what the customers want. The current situation in research that I've been uh, conducting here in North Carolina is based on the anticipatory orders. When you hover over something, whether it's on the Amazon website or whatever platform you're using, but you don't order it, Maybe you're looking at a variety of shoes and you finally decide, okay, that pair, it's got the right color, size, whatever, um, that's what I want. The system is actually sensing that you're looking at alternatives. The system, and this is, we know that this is happening at Amazon. They actually um, have patented this. And so we presume that other um, software platforms are doing the same thing. Um, is recording that you were interested in that other pair of shoes and somebody else has probably come along and is also hovering over that other pair of shoes. Maybe they actually ended up buying them. So the system is agglomerating all of that, those looks, but not buys. And at some point they're generating an order to their suppliers. I know of one company, they're not necessarily a supplier to Amazon because of these anticipatory orders and they, they only recently realized what was going on and they've now stopped ordering the supplies that potentially would go be sold online. They built up you know, for one commodity, a four year um, backlog or inventory, I should say. I mean, ludicrous, absolutely ludicrous. We believe that a lot of what's sitting on ships are the results of these anticipatory orders. You as a supplier do not want to lose a sale. How do you not lose a sale? You have the stock and in inventory. Now what's happening is warehouses all over the United States, and this is not just an American issue, it's happening around the world, are full. So even if the container whether it's an air container or it's a ocean container is discharged and released, there's no place to take the goods to. I have a picture um, of a line of containers outside a brand new distribution center being built in Nevada that is almost two miles long. And the distribution center, which is still under construction is already full doesn't have all of the racks and conveyor belts inside. They've just been putting stuff inside. Um, and it's, it's not moving because that anticipatory order has, the final order for the product still has not been received. How do you control this? I think some companies, I know of at least a couple, are just basically stopping all of their purchasing and they're saying, we will only order once we've drawn down to our usual stock levels. 
that may relieve what's happening on the ocean. I saw a report yesterday that said uh, many suppliers in China are saying, why are we continuing to make product when the product we know is not being sold? A, also, we can't get it on vessels because the vessels are over overloaded. This is primarily on the marine side, but I have to expect that it's also happening on the ocean side, maybe, I mean, the air side, maybe to a lesser extent. And so there's, there's, the pendulum is going to swing from high levels of congestion to relatively low levels of congestion. Nobody at this point knows how quickly the pendulum is going to swing back to a quote unquote near normal environment. So we have to, so how do you get around addressing all of these issues and, and, and many other issues that are out there? There has to be a change in mindset. Um, the statement um, by Stan Rate, who I have the pleasure of working with, um, who went in the KLM um, environment, one of the world's largest cargo airlines, in fact, the oldest airline in the world that's still operating, uh, literally from mailroom to overall head worldwide of their cargo system, says this. It doesn't really matter if the trip seven is operated by American Airlines or United. It goes at the same speed. It will take the same time to go from A to B. It looks basically the same in the belly as it, um, one from the other. You really don't understand other than maybe the paint color on the outside that one's different from the other. Unfortunately, the airline industry tends to focus in on the vehicle and not on the entire ecosystem. And that's a problem. Amazon doesn't really care. The shipping lines don't really care. The freight forwarders, the smart freight forwarders, the big freight forwarders like DSV or Cunanagle or Expeditors based in Seattle, they don't care. And yet, We've got an industry that still is worrying about what's the paint scheme on the outside, as opposed to how do all of the players work together, making sure that they do work together and making sure that they exchange information between them. Digitalization is here. It is expected. It's being demanded by border agencies, whether it's Customs and Border Protection here in the United States, UK Customs, uh, CBSA, which is the customs uh, agency in Canada, and on and on and on. In fact, I had conversations in Kenya almost 10 years ago. They were looking on how to facilitate um, trade um, in and out of Nairobi and Mombasa. Um, and yet, unfortunately, the airline industry, the traditional airline industry, with some exceptions, um, still hasn't got it. And it's very discouraging. So do we really understand who the beneficial cargo owners are? They may never see or handle the freight, but we still need to understand what their needs are, who they are, and what their expectations are, and now increasingly demands are, in order to create unique selling points, in order to understand their customers' needs, which they're trying to translate into their business units. They also expect everybody to collaborate. The idea of silos, and I'm gonna protect my information is not acceptable to them. When I worked in manufacturing a number of years ago in New Mexico, I worked with my suppliers, some of whom were in China, majority were here in the United States. And I shared with them what the expectations of our customers, some who were in the Middle East, some were in Europe, some were also in the United States, were expecting. In that way, I could help them to help me satisfy my customers. Did I share everything with them? No, of course not. Did they share everything with me? No, of course not. But where it made sense for us to collaborate, we collaborated. The airline industry, not so much, unfortunately, because at the end of the day, the BCOs are saying when I want it, where I want it, and how I want it. And unless you understand those very simple questions, 
I'm not saying that the solutions are simple, but until you understand those questions, are willing to listen to those demands, and then come up with innovative solutions, you are doomed to failure. You will join the manufacturers of buggy whips and probably very soon. Collaboration, I've already mentioned this. We believe at SASE and what I communicate to my students and most of my students are potential city and community um, planners is do not think about traditional partner, uh, vendorships. The, uh, a transactional basis, forget that. These are partnerships. These are long-term partnerships based on a free and open discussion of information and collaboration to come up with the best types of solutions. An example um, in the airline industry is the GHA, that's the ground handling agency. The people that typically load and unload the, um, the shipments, they may also be involved in helping to move passengers on and off aircraft, their baggage, whatever. They also operate the cargo terminals at the airports. This used to be done by airlines, but in a cost-cutting move, the airlines um, contracted out with third parties. But do airlines, instead of looking at that relationship on a cost-only basis, do they also look at it on a, how can the GHA help me attract more business? What is the partnership that I need to work with the GHA on what are their needs, what are their expectations, and how can I help them achieve their goals so that A, they're around, and B, we jointly provide a service which will be better than the other airline that's next door that I'm in competition with. A quick story, when we were negotiating the contract with United Parcel Service to start up their air operations, I worked for a, a contract airline, they were very tough and they are very tough in terms of how much they're willing to pay. And they'd already been doing a lot of due diligence and we'd been operating a couple of very small air, airplanes for them. So we had proven to them that we knew how to operate an airline, that we could operate on time consistently, et cetera, et cetera. They finally stopped and, and in the middle of the negotiations, their chief negotiator looked to our president and said, are you still making money? And that took, took our president back. And it been, these have been tough negotiations. And he said, well, not as much as we really would like, but I think we're okay. Um, and he said, well, you go away. You make sure that you're going to be okay. Never experienced this in negotiations in the past. This is in the 1980s, early 1980s. Went back. We did analysis. We figured out, okay, if we could get a little bit more We'd be, we would be fine. And we went back and said, well, if we could have a little bit more, that would assure us that we can provide the same level of service that we know that you need in order to meet your customers' customers' expectations. And UPS said, that's fine. We already know that you can do the work. We don't want to grind you into the ground by taking, and we're talking dollars, not pennies. Um, and that attitude, unfortunately, is, is infrequently employed in the airline industry, and yet it has to be. So what UPS was communi communicating to us is, yes, we have a very tight, strong contract, which we are going to hold your feet to the fire on, but it's a partnership. It's not a vendorship. And in fact, they extended the contract um, for a, a similar term because they really didn't want to lose our expertise. And they knew that if something went wrong, we had a solution. We would communicate what the solution was as quickly as we could come up with the solution. And they were looking for that. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen a lot in the traditional airline environment, and it needs to be. So they were, we were helping them figure out what the real product and service differentiators were because at the time they were in competition with FedEx, which had been in operation for a number of years with their own fleet. They were in competition with BN, um, 
CF Air Freight, with Emory Air Freight, with Purolator, et cetera, who we all operated, we, this small little airline based in, in Raleigh, North Carolina, operated the fleets for. Um, we never shared information across our customers, but they knew that they had to be different. They, UPS had to be different. And UPS at the time was not quite a hundred years old. All to build re robustness in the system, all to become resilient. So a shock would occur in the system, whether it was a bad storm, what have you. They, UPS, were looking at their contract carrier, their primary contract carrier, and saying, okay, if this happens, can you respond quickly and keep the entire operation going? Beneficial cargo owners are looking for the same thing. We know that things are going to happen. A volcano is going to erupt in Iceland and cause air routes um, on the transatlantic either to be shut down or significantly cur curtailed. We know that tsunamis are going to exist and they may wipe out airports. We know that this is going to happen. That's going to happen. I mean, they're, you know, what's happening in the Ukraine, Russia. I mean, these things are happening. But what the beneficial cargo owners are looking for, not just for the air cargo industry, but for all of the freight modes is how do you respond? Do you have the capacity? And most importantly, do you have the systems and the people in place that can think outside the box and come up with innovative solutions? And oh, by the way, you're always looking for a better way to do what you do through continuous quality improvement or whatever technology or system or concept you want to employ. Information, information, information. Remember that little red box that I put beside disruption? That's the key to everything. And the air cargo industry is they can't hide behind the fact that our planes fly very fast from point A to point B. No, how do they, how do they participate in the entire supply ecosystem? How do they work with all of the other partners in the worldwide air cargo logistics industry? The UN Resolution 33, which is now over 10 years old, um, basically said, from a national perspective, from an individual country perspective, you need to focus in on single window. That means you need, as an individual nation, and China's already well down this path along with um, European nations, you need to provide a way that you can collect all of the information that is required to make sure that your country is safe and secure, but that trade is flowing across the borders and primarily use a digital approach. I'm actually working on a subsequent white paper for the United Nations on this. It's not happening in many, many countries. In the air cargo industry, it's really not happening, unfortunately. And the way they saw it, back then, which is what there are, and there's numerous services which have emerged, is how do you do it electronically? How do you enter the data once and not have to re-enter the data in your own legacy system, but use apps or whatever uh, electronic or other systems are available to exchange the information? How can you reduce the errors? If I'm dyslexic and Martin sends me a, a, a document and I type in the numbers in reverse because I'm dyslexic, that shipment just disappeared, totally disappeared. The physical box is sitting in the terminal, but there's no paperwork trail. Well, we need to get over replicating and re-entering data that was used when I, was, when I started back in the 70s, but we've gone well beyond that. And there's a whole body of research, there's a whole body of analysis that is yet to be employed to show how we can do that. And at the bottom line, it's sharing is essential. Providing the full end-to-end -end visibility, that company I mentioned based, the logistics um, group based here in North Carolina, they wanted, and I was allowed into their control tower, which was fascinating. This is now six years ago. They were tracking every single skew around the world. 
And that was why they would not rely on air cargo because the air cargo industry collectively could not provide that information. They wanted to know where that plane was or where that ship was or where that truck was, but they also wanted to know specifically what's inside, what's happening to their freight. It's available, the systems are available. They created a lot of their own systems, but they really didn't want to spend the time because that was not their real core business in creating their own electronic systems to track down to the SKU level. And they were looking for partners that could. I've belabored this a lot, but break down the silos for crying out loud and share the information. Be careful of what you're sharing. Don't share your IP, of course, but create partnerships. Work together to provide the solutions that your um, customer's customer expect and demand. And as a result of the sharing, then you can create better systems, better products um, through collaboration. It's not rocket science. It's not easily done either. But unless the air cargo industry really addresses these expectations, and I'm talking about the traditional airlines, with some exceptions, it's not that the air cargo industry will go away, but the complexion, the structure, the members of the air cargo industry are going to change significantly. And we're seeing that as Maersk and CMA, CGM, as Amazon and Alibaba, um, and as other non-traditional players come into the marketplace. Digitize, this looks at a, a concept, this, this diagram focusing on a concept called the airport cargo community system. The first version of the air cargo community system actually um, occurred in transactions, well, actually more of the digital logistics corridor, and I'll get to that in a minute, uh, between Canada and the UK um, some 30 plus years ago. If you look at airports throughout India, they all have air car airport cargo community systems. They're at different stages depending on how old they are. They have different features depending on how old they are. Um, they have different um, array of stakeholders who are involved, again, depending on their age, but they're already in operation. And as a result, there is a better assurance that cargo that's arriving in an airport in India or being uh, dispatched from an airport in India, that everybody knows what's going on. It doesn't matter how big the company is, it doesn't matter what the company is involved in, whether it's a trucking company, a forwarder, a customs agent, doesn't matter. But they all understand what is happening and coincidentally, what their, the expectations of the BCOs are for what they do. There's one airport in the United States, Atlanta. Nobody else is doing this. Not LA, not Dallas, not Miami. They're looking at them, but nobody else is doing this. And it's, it's sort of unbelievable. In, in Europe, Amsterdam and Rotterdam are tied. One's air, one's ocean, but they're still tied because there are flows of traffic that migrate from ocean to, to air and vice versa. Digital logistics quarters takes this to the next step. So it ties airports together, whether it's Bangalore with Munich for the pharmaceutical trade or it's Mumbai with, um, Amsterdam for a wide variety of trades. Um, again, Amsterdam is working on establishing links uh, in Europe and also in the Middle East to facilitate trade between those two airports, but it goes beyond the airports so that a, a company that's producing something, say in Germany, and the product is being rooted over Amsterdam and it's gonna end up in Houston, Texas, but the air portion is to Atlanta, they have full visibility and they don't have to re-enter the data. And at the same time, Netherlands customs, German customs, US customs have full visibility over the product, not only to ensure that the right duties and taxes are being paid, but that the whole overall flow is secure. 
Very, very important, unfortunately, in this day and age. The systems already exist. It uses open access, highly encrypted digital platforms. The communication systems are already in place. The problem is that traditional companies are unwilling to participate in this. And they're the ones that are at risk of losing everything. Again, I don't understand it, but that's the way the world is. Other technologies, whether it's drones, EV tall aircraft, um, there's a wide variety of existing or about to emerge and be employed technologies that are out there. And this is all part and parcel, not of the traditional air cargo industry, but of the industry that needs to emerge and very quickly in order to ensure that the services that we have come to rely on, primarily for us as consumers, speed, are also highly accurate, highly sustainable, highly resilient, and highly consistent. If the same shipments can move over the same trade lanes in the same period of time with some exceptions for a variety of exogenous reasons, those are the trade lanes that I as a producer of goods, a seller of goods want to rely on. I do not want to worry about, am I going to hit a traffic jam on the I-710 coming out of the port of LA Long Beach going up to Compton or on the I-5? I want to know that consistently at every time of day, on every day of the week, every hour in the year, the same process occurs with the same regularity. I cannot survive if I'm trying to figure out, well, it's a Tuesday afternoon and I know there's always a, um, a traffic jam on the uh, I-77-85 interchange outside Charlotte, North Carolina, and there usually is. Or maybe tomorrow there isn't. Well, I've already planned that there is. Okay, so the truck gets there earlier, but there's no truck dock available because the truck's there earlier. I, I do not want to have to worry about that. So I'm looking for systems that provide that understanding of what's going on in a timely fashion so that I can always ensure that I meet the schedules of my customer's customer. Walmart started it many years ago with everything in full on time. They put in horrific, horrendous, uh, penalties if you did not deliver in full on time at their distribution centers, and they're not the only ones that are adopting that uh, approach. Challenge the norms. This goes not just for the air cargo industry, but I'm picking on the air cargo industry since it's the topic of this presentation, but it's challenge the norms in everything you do. I don't care what was done that way for years. I'll, I'll tell you a quick story about when we were starting up UPS. One of my um, assignments was to look at our schedule reliability because we had pretty significant penalties for delayed flights. And you understood why we had to get those planes out because they were needed to arrive at the sort center or that the endpoints of the, of the network so that the goods could be processed and or delivered on time as committed by United Parcel Service. So we're dealing with the maintenance of our airplanes. And, and traditionally airplanes are, are, the maintenance crew comes on to an airplane, this is back in the 70s and 80s, before the flight is to depart. We reverse that. We said, it's probably not going to break uh, or anything on the airplane is going to break while it's sitting on the ramp. It usually happens when it's moving. Okay, use that as the basis. So why don't we have the maintenance crews show up when the plane arrives? And if there is a problem, we call it a fault in the industry, 
we will address it then. So we have time to recover. We have time to order a part or we have time to fix whatever the hose is broken or whatever, or replace a, um, an instrument in, on the panel in the cockpit. We have the time then. Initially, our maintenance people went, well, we don't do it that way. And we said, well, yeah, okay, if you don't do it that way, are you gonna pay the penalty that we are gonna have to pay UPS if the plane isn't ready? Well, no, of course they didn't wanna do that. As a result, and our on-time requirement, unlike the traditional airline industry, which is 15 minutes from scheduled departure, we were held to six minutes. So basically a third of the time, our on-time um, departure ratio was at 99.9%. Simple, challenge the norm, think about a different way to uh, provide a solution. The traditional airlines, if they want to survive, need to take that same approach. There are a lot of smart young people in the airlines, some of whom have left for a variety of reasons during COVID, but a lot of them get it. And they need to just challenge their bosses, who in some cases have been in the air, airline industry a long time. Again, there are exceptions and say, well, why do we do it that way? Why can't we do it this way? Because that's what their customers' customers are already doing. And they just expect everybody else in the industry to have that same attitude. Now, you might find out that's the only way you can do it fine. Can you do it better? Probably. Or you may come up with a quote unquote better mousetrap. What else is next? More and more BCOs are saying you will protect the environment. To what extent you can, that's up for negotiation. That's up for assessment. That's up for in-depth analysis. One option, of course, is sustainable aviation fuels. United Airlines, British Airways, Virgin Atlantic, and others are saying, we're going to only burn sustainable fuels. That's one way of protecting the environment. Is it cost prohibitive? Yes, it is right now for a variety of reasons. Maybe it's the source of the material, maybe it's the processing of the product, whatever it is. My expectation is that cost differential will decline just the same as solar was more expensive than traditional sources of electricity. And now it's either on a par or it's less costly. Industry will figure out how to reduce costs, still maintain their margins so that they are sustainable and, and resilient and we'll all benefit from it. And the airlines are getting more and more behind it because surprise, surprise, the freight that they're carrying are demanding this. And in some cases, um, so are the passengers, although we're only dealing with freight at this moment. Sustainability and resiliency. Resiliency is the ability to respond to a shock. Sustainability is to plan for the future, to be prepared to change and accommodate whatever the long-term future might bring. Well, the way you do that, and I've actually uh, inserted a risk um, matrix from ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization um, in, on this slide is understand your risk and benefit reward system, innovate, but with the idea that you're not gonna eliminate all risks, but you're at least gonna mitigate the risk. So that again, going back to the sustainable approach, but also the consistency that everybody is looking for, you can figure out, okay, once in a while this is gonna happen, but overall, I will always be able to provide the same level of service, the same transit times to all my customers. Some may need it more than others, that's fine. In a product portfolio, you're gonna understand who really needs that extra level of care and who is not as demanding for that extra level of care. Another area um, that we really believe at Sassy World in is you focus on the airports. Airports, like any other um, freight terminal, are a point of intersection between the hinterland and the foreland. They are hopefully not a choke point. Hopefully they are a facilitator of the movement of goods that 
go across the wharf, go across the aircraft ramp, transit through the rail yard, whatever the, the, the environment is. In order to do that, they, airport authorities, also need to take this same approach. Not being a tenant, I mean, sorry, not being a landlord and looking at everybody who works on the airport as tenants, a transactional relation, um, focus, but look on the partnerships. What can I do to facilitate the success of the airlines that are linking my airport to other airports around the world? What can I do to facilitate the success of the ground handling agents that are handling those planes? What can I do to facilitate the trucks that are bringing the freight or carrying the freight off my airport? Not a transactional basis, not doing short-term fixes, maybe collaboratively sharing some of the pain, but also the upside so that my airport stands above a competing airport, whether it's an airport that's in close proximity to another, um, say on the West Coast, whether it's in Southern California or up in the Northwest, or even an airport that's distant. Cargo, unlike passengers, can be moved longer distances from one location to a more remote airport than passengers. You don't want to drive, say, from the LA basin up to San Francisco to get a lower airfare. You just don't. Trucks will routinely move freight from LA to San Francisco, from Atlanta to Chicago, from uh, Philadelphia or, 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 sorry, Pittsburgh to Chicago or New York routinely in the search for a lower rate. That's a waste. But what they're looking for traditionally is lower rate, or there's more capacity, or there's higher frequency of service, whatever the case is. If individual airports look at what they can do by providing the environment that is supportive of all of their partners, all of the key stakeholders, they can eliminate a lot of this movement of goods over long distances, this leakage as it's called, between airports. And at the same time, if they, if they retain more traffic, they will provide a base for more services, which again will increase the draw and the attractiveness of the airports. What's happening on the airport is sometimes not even as important of what's happening off the airport. There are essentially freight villages. This is a concept that's um, in development and research by McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, of the evolution of freight villages uh, in, in work that we're already doing for the Transportation Research Board at SASE. We've identified freight villages in and around Toronto International Airport, Canada's largest um, airport. Um, how do you link those freight villages to what's happening on the airport? How do you facilitate the movement of goods by road from an off airport facility to an on airport facility? Florida DOT is examining, and this is primarily for their seaports, is examining the uh, likelihood or the, um, not so much likelihood, but the, um, the appropriateness of having trucks that can control traffic signals. In, in many parts of the, of the world, uh, emergency vehicles can change the light from red to green so that they can move down that street or corridor. FDOT, Florida DOT, has been working with uh, researchers at Florida Atlantic and others, other institutions in Florida to see does it make sense for us to consider that same system to move truck traffic on and off our ports? Not only does it benefit the flow of goods on each individual truck, but it increases the attractiveness of the uh, ports in Florida as opposed to in Georgia or Alabama or wherever. 
So that's, that's something to be considered. The oh, level of me. service. Excuse me, yeah. Professor Edwards. Yeah. Uh, we might already reach uh, 10, 15. Okay, and and I've, have, uh, this is my last slide. So okay. I'll finish this up, Martin. Um, so what are the appropriate facilities support digitalization? We need to reduce emissions. If you're more efficient, trucks aren't idling, planes are not idling, whatever, you can reduce um, emissions. Look at model, multimodal operations, especially sea air with the MERS, the CMA, CGMs, et cetera. Um, how do you market your facility? How do you differentiate your facility? And also, what is the role of your facility in, in the broader economic development arena in the region, in the locality in which the airport um, is located? Again, it's through collaboration, it's through digitalization, it's through focusing on your customer's customer that you can achieve all of these um, benefits. Um, Thank Martin. This is just a mission. It's in, in, in the slide deck, but this is what we do at SASE World, um, headquartered in Montreal, but offices in the United States and, and elsewhere. Um, and with that, I am done. So I'm open for any questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Charles. Thank you. Let's give a warm applause for Charles. Thank you so much. Uh, there's a hand here. Oh, Courtney. Uh, Courtney. Yes, please just unmute yourself. And for those of you who have questions, you just also type in the chat box and I could read for Professor Charles. Yeah, Courtney, please go ahead. Yes, thank you, Charles, for a great, uh, great seminar. And so my question is uh, digitalization. Uh, uh, so Courtney Robinson, I work for uh, the United Nations International Civil Aviation Organization, which Charles uh, uh, mentioned over the course of, uh, of this talk. Uh, and I've been, uh, actually, we've been working with UNECE, uh, the UN Economic Commission for Europe, a, a sister agency of ours to develop standards, um, uh, I, I would say guidance material for air cargo digitalization. And I'll actually just put a, uh, I'll have some background. I just put in there, not for self promotion, but just for clarity on what we've. Uh, uh, what we've created. But one of the, the things that gets my attention, is Charles, his mention of uh, this reluctance uh, with digitalization. So one of the things that we have promoted in our latest exercise, you know, we've just finished the deliverables recently, is that they're free of charge. But, uh, and that there, there's, there's been some interest. I've uh, uh, received some emails from major cargo carriers. Um, you know, who, who ask questions, we'll see, you know, to how far they, they, they take the discussion. But it just remains surprising that there is this reluctance. So I'm just wondering if you could say a little bit more on why you think that is, uh, given the, the, the number of things out there, you know, we just put out some free things. Um, right. And this is in the COVID-19 context, it's, it reduces touch. And I think you've gone through all these, you know, allows remote work for people along the supply chain, many benefits, but um, as we look at how to, you know, if we, you're going to invest more, getting a return, um, and there's concern, you know, if that doesn't happen. So your thoughts on that? So I think there's a couple of issues at play. One is many companies have already developed their own systems. And so they have an expectation of return on investment. Um, and they want to they want to maximize their return on investment if they've invested a million dollars or whatever. Um, so there's a reluctance to, quote unquote, throw that out um, and revert to these other systems that are in play. Those system, many of the new systems that are in play that have emerged that are being adopted do not mean that individual companies have to throw their existing system out because they're using an app for the interface with these open access digital platforms. But there, in some cases, the communicating that has been weak. Okay. I think another is this reluctance to share information. There is this fear that if I share information, I lose market power. 
I may lose the ability to adjust pricing and attract business from the old days, from the old environment where I controlled all of the information, whether it's, it's about my customer or whether it's about my operations, whatever. And the BCOs are saying, we don't care. Um, but it, there's this reluctance and there's this fear. And I think it's primarily and unfortunately from the small and the, the midsize operators um, who are hoping that we'll go back to the, the, old, the good old days, quote unquote, whatever those are. Um, and they just have to get over it. They just have to understand that that's what it was, but it's no longer that way. And they also need to understand what are the skill sets that are required either in their own staff or in experts that they bring in on a, on a variable cost basis in order to migrate from the traditional uh, approaches and relationships to the new environment. So there's, there's probably those three, there's, there's others, but I think you can compress all of that into those three approaches. It's all about information and education at the end of the day and a willingness to challenge the norms. Hopefully I answered Thanks. your question, Courtney. Yeah, I, I, I think so, especially that reluctance to share data because we're going to lose out. Uh, but, you know, your point about, you know, that the BCOs, you know, wanting that information, right. I suppose they're going to have to get. Um, right. So and they'll, they'll go wherever the data is available. I mean, they, they'll, they'll select who their partners are going to be. And if you're not willing to share or unable to share, sorry, but you just won't have their business. And I think it's, and then I'll, I'll, I'll shut up. But I think one of the things that is going to help drive that now that you put it out there, the work that, uh, you know, IKO, our, our, we cater to regulators needs and regulators, when we look at cargo security, cargo safety, they are regulating that you turn over more and more information. And maybe they, I mean, they want it for safe safety, for security. They want to use it to drive, uh, uh, you had a risk matrix up there risk-based decision-making for our artificial intelligence. You know, does this, do we need to stop this package? We need to inspect it. Is there something wrong here? Right. All these things. So what you're saying, it, it, it makes, uh, it resonates, makes lots of sense. So uh, thank you. Good. Other questions? Thank you for um, Courtney's question. Yeah, I could read out the question for Charles. Uh, a question from Eduardo. Could you comment a little bit more on the advantages on the using or combining the blockchain technology, I guess is in the uh, airline industry, just in terms of security and transactions. Yeah, okay, so there's a, there's a number of benefits. One, the encryption level, um, I mean, so that once you enter the data, it is secure. Um, and that can be done a couple of different ways. Uh, I'm not a uh, data um, expert, uh, so I'll stay out of it. But the encryption levels, whether it's 64 level or 32 level, whatever, I mean, that already exists. And it's already employed in a variety of, of environments. Two, it is entering the data, the original data once. So you're not re-entering data. It's like that um, example I used about I'm dyslexic, and so I put all of the numbers in the wrong order. Um, whoever is putting in the original data, whether it's about the shipment, whether it's about the transportation mode, whether it's about the handling, whatever, that's only done once. And so you increase the efficiency and you reduce the error rate. And that essentially is blockchain technology. You add information to each block. In this case, each block is a shipment. And then it moves through the chain. Um, again, there's a lot of, especially small and mid-sized companies, they don't either have the internal expertise or the financial wherewithal to understand and to study. I mean, they've got a business model which they're pursuing uh, and they're probably pretty good at what they do. And so they need to be willing to open the veil and say, okay, I don't understand this, but I think I need to do this. So how do I do it? And there are services that are, not they don't necessarily require a heck of a lot of an upfront investment of CapEx, which in many cases for small and mid-sized companies is limited. Um, 
And on the long term, they don't have to make an investment in whole new systems. They can, they can participate in a transactional basis. So the alternatives exist. Again, it's informing these companies and educating them on how they can play, but also more importantly, why they need to participate in a, in a quote unquote blockchain environment. Yeah, thank you, Professor Charles. Uh, does it help add a other? Sorry? Oh, I'm asking, uh, does it help? Oh, oh. Add yeah, yeah, that helps. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome. Yeah. Uh, are there any questions for Professor Edwards? Uh, I actually have a question. Uh, okay. Char Charles, so you quote uh, Mr. Stan Wright's quote. So mm -hmm. uh, flying, uh, it doesn't matter uh, which company uh, fly the flight, it matters on the ground. Can you right. elaborate a little bit about it? Is it the ability to discharge the goods that makes a real difference? Um, that's probably a, an overarching uh, summation of the, of the situation. So let, the, the, the problem at, the problem is the lack of information. So we know that in some cases, well, definitely back in the bad old days, um, we would have a flight that would arrive and then we found out what was on the flight. We thought we knew what was supposed to be on the flight, but we didn't know exactly what was on the flight because the information lagged the flight. There is no excuse for that happening now. Well, if you know what's coming in on the flight, and even if it's a moderately um, long flight, say from New York to um, um, to London or, or vice versa. So you've got six mm -hmm. to seven hours. You can plan how many people do I need? What equipment do I need? Where do I need to deploy it? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's just with on the ramp and in the, in the cargo terminal. At the same time, because customs already has the information as is required by law, they can all be already be selecting, well, that shipment, it's cleared. We know that we'll get, our, we'll get paid for our duties and taxes. So it can be available as quickly as the cargo terminal operator can get it off the airplane into their facility and be ready for pickup. There's a lot of benefits to that. You reduce congestion in the immediate vicinity in the airport. Um, there is better utilization for the truck operator, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Again, it's the sharing of the information. Um, that's the holdup. That, that's the, the primary issue. Um, airports that already use these airport cargo community systems do, can eliminate a lot of those delays. I'll give you an example. Atlanta went from eight hours delay probably worst case for truckers mm -hmm. to get onto the airport to collect freight down to 30 minutes what are the benefits if i'm a dray operator if i'm moving shipments back and forth to a terminal whether it's an ocean terminal a rail terminal or an airport it makes all the same i need to do that twice a day minimum in order to make money an eight hour day i was out of time I wouldn't make mm -hmm. any money. So why would I provide the service? But if there's a facility, if there's a system in place that allows me to make money, A, I'm, I want to stay in the business. So I'm going to be around. So I'm more sustainable than somebody who is operating in an airport that doesn't have that luxury, doesn't have that environment. So it's better off for everybody, include, especially for the BCOs and for the airlines and for the cargo terminals. If the operator is warehouse is full because the truckers don't know when to come and pick up the goods or deliver the goods, then I become less efficient. So my sustainability becomes questionable. My resiliency levels go precipitously down. Again, it's sharing the information. I see, I see. Oh, thank you, thank you, Charles, for answering my question. Sure. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Did I put everybody to sleep? I always have you to know, ask I th that. I think it's pretty thought provoking. Yeah, good. Uh, in our transportation branch, we don't have a, a, a faculty work on the aviation part. I think this would be a very open eye. Uh, 
seminar for the students. Well, good, good. That's um, again, it's a lot of what is being done in the other modes. Um, a lot of what's being done in John in the non transportation environment. Mm -hmm. It's it's applicable. And we're dealing with the air cargo industry right now in this, in this seminar, it's applicable to this industry. And again, people have to challenge the norms. People have to be willing to share both the good and the bad and be willing to say, hmm, I think I can apply that to my situation. It may not be easy, but I, if I can and if it works, that means that I'm going to be around a lot longer. I'm going to make more money or whatever the metric is that they're they're focusing it on. Yeah, I see, I see. Uh, can, can I ask also a follow-up question? So sure. for, for the share of information, so which party might be the most unwilling to share the information? Are the uh, airline, airline companies or the airport or? There, there's, I don't think there's any one group that is above suspicion. There are members of each group, some of whom are more willing to share, and there are others who are less willing to share. Um, and I really don't want to be drawn into specific companies because that's part of what we do at Sassy World. Um, so um, we know who are more reluctant. We know who are more open to sharing information. Um, so there's good actors, there's bad actors. Uh, there's uh, leading edge. There's companies that are willing to, to challenge and, and be leading edge. There's laggards. Um, and, and, and so it, it's a mix, but I think collectively where it has been done, if one looks what IATA, the International Air Transport Association, which is basically just for airlines, had attempted to do with Cargo 2000. Well, the last time I checked, we're now 2022. So we missed that deadline by 22 years, almost a quarter of a century. And that began not in 2020, but that began at least a decade and probably 15 years even before 2020. Um, it was done in pieces and parts. And and, and we're talking about an ecosystem. We call it the worldwide air cargo logistics industry. We, don't talk, we do not call it the airline cargo industry. We do not talk about the freight forwarder industry. They're all part and parcel. They all play important roles. And we've never approached, to, to Courtney's point, um, it, uh, ICAO can not mandate, but they can encourage these types of systems. Um, and they're probably the only group that's really trying to take a holistic approach to this. A FIATA, which represents freight forwarder associations around the world, is trying to, uh, on a multimodal perspective, take a holistic approach, an ecosystem approach. But there's been very few organizations or companies that have said, this is what we've got to do. So the MERS, CMA CGMs, the Amazons, the Alibabas are saying, right, we're just going to do it. And if you're willing to work with us, because I don't think Amazon really wants to have its own airline, but they can't find anybody that's really willing to respond to what their needs are, and they're in mm -hmm. turn responding to the people that own the, own the goods. I don't, unfortunately, I don't see this as a um, industry-wide adoption, although it should be. It should be very easy to do, especially with the systems that are in place. It's going to be the major disruptors who are going to say, like the FedEx and UPSs of the 1980s, this is what we're going to do. And if you still want to have traffic that you can make money from, that's what you're going to have to do. And if you don't, Sorry, you're not going to be around. I see, I see. So there's also people's mindset towards it. Yep, it's, it, it, it all comes down to the willingness to challenge the norms and to be open to new ideas. That's Carl, the can I just add something here? Sure. Sure, sure. Um, 
I've been involved. I just came back from the Middle East. I've also been involved in long communications with Chinese and with one of actually the third largest e-commerce. Uh, the situation on data is there's twofold why we have to move this way. One is security. Uh, obviously, cybersecurity is an element. <clears throat> We've been following that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then following that with Charles's presentation. But the other thing is, I'll give you an example what's possible with these systems being integrated into the airports, into the customs brokerage, and into the largest, third largest company in the world for e-commerce told me they can move cargo airport to door uh, from China to Europe, delivered into last mile delivery, same day it arrives in, in a European port. Okay, so it'll arrive in Heathrow or Rotterdam, oh, sorry, Amsterdam or whatever. They can have it out of there the same day and injected into a last mile delivery because they took it upon themselves to implement the systems on the ground. The problem is it's a horrific expense for them. They're looking to the industry to provide that for them and they will choose the carriers that can provide them in the future, airport to airport plus customs clearance plus preparation of the e-commerce for last mile de delivery and injection into the last mile service provider system. Either they pick it up or they deliver it. Just to give you a realization, this company moves 600,000 tons a year of air freight. They are the single largest customer of uh, UPS, FedEx and DHL. And they have to do it themselves to get it to work except for FedEx, UPS, and DHL. So if you're Air Canada, United Airlines, British Airways, Lufthansa, you have to look at this and realize that if you do not participate in the digitization uh, a format, be you a forwarder or an airline or a trucking company, whatever, you will just be squeezed out of the business in the future. It's as simple as that. Uh, most hesitant to join, ground handling agents, because they think they have to have a unique selling point. They're not willing to give 10% of the transparency uh, for the community good, for the airport good, for the infrastructure development of the airport's good. They try to do it as a unique selling point of their own, disregarding the rest of the airport and the community. That's, that is, an, uh, they're a big problem in this. Uh, the freight forwards, it's all about not trusting that their, dot, their proprietary data is protected. We have to educate them that it is. And the third thing, of course, is customs and, and other people and authorities to trust the, the, the data because the data problem for security is the weakest link. And that could be a small airline or a small GHA who allows them to hack in and, and disrupt the whole system. So that's the third part, which is education. We're heavily, heavily, heavily involved in this, in making sure that this chain works. Uh, it's all of our time, really, uh, because we see it as a solution, and airlines uh, are asking for that solution because they want to serve this market. They don't want to lose it to, uh, to the other disruptors. Okay? So I, sorry to interrupt, Charles, but I think after no last, we haven't had a chance to catch up after a return from my trip, but that just gives you an indication uh, we've identified the pain points, but we need Courtney's help. Uh, we need uh, at IKO. Uh, we need the Customs Authority, Transport Canada, US CBP, uh, Homeland Security to jump on board for the security parts of it, the cybersecurity parts of it. The rest of it we can do ourselves, but we really need the help of IKO and the UN and 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 the other government authorities to get the trust that this data. Uh, can can be used, right? And you know, I'll I'll, you. I'll just extend it, but also apply it to the marine industry. I mean, a lot of the okay, I talked about the anticipatory orders, but a lot of what's happening at LA Long Beach, at Savannah, Georgia, where they have thirty five plus ships waiting off. It's not as big as the flotilla sitting off in you know, San Pedro Bay, on New York, Seattle, etc. Is the is the free and open exchange of information. I've never seen, I've been in this business for 50 years. I have never seen a meltdown of the supply chain environment to the degree it's melted down here in the United States. Yeah, we've had issues from time to time, but I mean, and a lot of it is because we're not exchanging information. So, 
I guess that's my final statement. <laughs> Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Stan, for your comments. That really helps to understand the talk, the title of this talk, Cargo, the Savior of Commercial Airline Industry. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, any question from the audience? Last call. If not, uh, we might just uh, thank Charles again and thank you for Courtney and Stan and every other's question. Thank you so much. And thank you again for your time. Wish next time we could uh, meet you in person and invite you to come to UCRFI. I would love to come out. It's been a while since I've been at Irvine, but yep, we love, I'd love to continue this discussion. So if there's anything, please, you've got my contact information, so reach out to me. Yeah, really appreciate that. Okay. And thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. All right, thank you, you too. Thank Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you, Charles. Thank you so much.